Hey, fun fans. We're getting close to reaching 1 million views on YouTube, and to help us celebrate 254, the Cheesy Poos has provided us an awesome t-shirt to give away. All you have to do to be entered is to be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which team you're from. You can enter once in every YouTube video uploaded through the month of September, so make sure you comment below. So back in November of last year, uh, we found out that the 2020 FRC season will feature no more stop build slash bag and tag. Um, and now many months later, we're starting to learn what that means. So keep in mind, these rules are brand new. Um, and therefore, the discussion is all new, too. And the more questions that we ask, whether it's between the community members um, and more discussions that are had, the clearer the areas for clarification will be later on. Um, if you need a full visual of what really happened, let's jump back a few months and let our friend, uh, the one and only Mike Corsetto from Citrus Circuits, describe it. So, uh, I, have a, I have a prop to demonstrate what's happening. Uh, well, I can't really tear it, but uh, yeah, the bag, <laughs> the bag is gone in 2020. All right, so after either the joy or rage of uh, No More Bag wore off for you, uh, what did you start to think about before the rules were released? And now that we know a little bit more about what an FRC season with no bag will look like, what are your thoughts? So, Ryan, what, do you, what did you think before we were kind of given this blog post recently? And what do you think now that you've actually read it? Uh, initially, super excited, right? Um, I think there's been a lot of talk over the years about how kind of outdated even the bag is. Um, you know, it's kind of a holdover from the era where we would put our robots in a crate, and uh, that was the only way you'd get it to the venue. Um, so, you know, initially excited because it was going to help a lot of teams out um, that, you know, would lose access to their robot, especially teams that are still in the uh, regional model. Um, and then, you know, after this update came out, um, still pretty excited, you know, I think it's gonna help a lot of teams, uh, especially kind of those mid-level, lower mid-level teams that, um, you know, don't, don't always have like the most resources. They may only build one robot and now they're gonna have access to that robot. They're gonna be able to keep working on it right up until uh, pretty much their event. So uh, mm. really excited about that. Uh, and Adam, what about you? Um, I had a lot of different thoughts. Uh, my, my initial concern was the number of teams that are going to expand their scope based on no bag. Um, and I would say to them, you know, treat this next season as if that's not even a thing. Don't change your schedule accordingly. Um, and then I shifted into being, you know, just happy that we don't have to make that extra robot and spend all that extra time and the stress of, you know, Thursday upgrades and that sort of thing. And then I kind of moved on to, I think, a really cool thing that could pop up. And I know a couple places are doing this, like Michigan has some, Canada has some, but community practice fields that uh, can run organized practice over the course of the season, I think will be the next big thing in high density team areas to really help a lot of those, you know, middle pack and lower tier teams climb up. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And Eric, what about you? What are your thoughts um, pre-blog post and post-blog post? Yeah, I mean, pre-blog post was, uh, I guess, pre-rules, uh, super excited. Um, mainly because, I mean, history of WAVE is we show up Thursday at every competition and basically rebuild our robot because we made all these changes to our practice robot, and now we don't have to do that. I even made a wager with uh, a lead robot inspector in Minnesota that will be the first team inspected at our first competition this year um, because we're like, we're going to show up like ready to go. Cause we're not going to spend eight hours on Thursday, you know, tearing a robot down and putting it back together. Um, I think uh, post rules, I think there's, there's a lot of questions and a lot of issues with how it's worded on what can actually be done when regards to when you're at competition, helping other teams. But uh, I think long, long term, this is going to make most teams better especially teams who were stretching to build practice robots who maybe now they can use those finances to just build one robot and iterate it more and have more drive time because i mean at the end of the day stick time is more important than you know pretty much anything else you do yeah i would agree and for me like when i first um thought about it it was like okay well now you know in a district we get unbag time which being able to unbag your robot and work on it in your own shop you know with your resources and you know, a lot of people in district would go to a team's practice field and unbag. So it's nice to see that that 
like to me, I thought about, oh, you know, regional teams would be able to have kind of that same experience, you know, without the limitations of the bag. But like you had said, now that there's some uncertainty, I'm like not sure how I feel about it. So for me, yeah. like the, the key takeaways from some of the rules that were published and given to us were um, the new method for inspection, 150 pound limit for all configurations that will be used on the field. New configurations not included in that 150 pound limit require reinspection and withholding allowance is no more. So you can bring as much as you want to the venue, but it all must be loaded in during the official load in period. So a lot of this is, I mean, for, for people that are really, you know, into FRC and have been around for a long time, it's, it's pretty easy to understand to some extent. Um, you know what questions to start asking, or you know what train of thought to go down. But what do you think um, new teams really need to know and understand to ensure that they don't really royally screw anything up for themselves or somebody else when they show up to their first event? And, you know, some teams may be panicking or, you know, watching other teams like a Hawk. Um, what do you think newer teams or those like under-resourced teams, I guess, need to know um, based on everything that we've gotten so far? Yeah, I'll take it. Um... I think like second year team, third year team, you know, like that, I think they need to just stick to the schedule that they had the previous year. Like the bag and tag, like stop build day still happens. I mean, I wave, I'm putting stop build day on our calendar and the goal is obviously to have it, you know, at least one robot done by a typical stop build day. And I think every team should be operating like that this first year and rookie teams are kind of at a disadvantage because they've never had a stop build. So hopefully if a state has their senior mentors, senior mentors can reach out to those teams and let them know how it goes. Veteran teams in their area can reach out to them and be like, hey, I know it says that you can, you know, build your robot off into the competition, but, you know, you shouldn't. I mean, every year people go to competitions and rookies show up with a kit of parts because they didn't understand you couldn't build the robot, that you could build the robot, sorry, during the build season. You didn't have to show up to the competition and build it there. So I think, you know, hopefully this helps with that and teams can start reaching out now and you know, even build season and really get teams and mentor the new teams to get them up to speed in a, a way that hopefully makes them not have those struggles. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that we got from chat, Ferrari 77, this question's for Adam, um, wants to know, do you think it's smart for teams to forgo building a second robot and just build one? Aren't you worried about putting way too many hours um, onto the real robot and running it into the ground? Or are teams that are not building that extra robot, really just going from three robots, one in the bag, two for practice slash programming, to two robots, two for practice slash programming? Um, you know, so I think there's levels to this, and it's really going to vary with where your team is at currently. Um, if you're a team that currently builds one robot, that's a good reason to stick with one. If you're a team that's building two, I, I could see that going either way depending on what your team is. I think it's a really legitimate concern running your robot into the ground, um, but that's really gonna be a function of how much you practice. If your team's gonna practice 10, 20 hours a week and not really do scrimmages with other teams and hitting with defense and that sort of thing, you could probably stick with one robot. If you're gonna get into those 40 plus hours a week that you hear some of the, the real big boy teams do, I think that's when you wanna start having two robots. Or if the game or your team you know, really incentivizes autonomous, um, I think there's a lot of value in keeping that comp bot for you know minimal driver testing, minimal programming, all your auto development, um, and keep that really nice and pristine, and then beat up your practice robot for almost everything else. I think but that's I, a good I, I, to round that out. I don't think you'll see a lot of three robot teams anymore. Um, you know, two D four did three last year. The current discussions uh, I think have us leaning towards two, but we haven't formalized that decision. So I'll, I'll add on to that real quick. So we build two robots or have for the past couple of years, but um, we're definitely a smaller team. So really our biggest resource is time and people and having to have us go make that second robot every year is just a huge struggle. So we're pretty much only going to make one. I think we've decided um, unless, you know, something crazy changes, but um I just think it's going to benefit so many teams that are kind of in that spot where we're at, where uh, people and time are kind of your most valuable resources more than funding. So based on um, kind of the rules update that we've gotten so far, what do you guys feel are the major takeaways for you for teams to really look at and get a really good understanding of? 
And I we're going to go first. Go ahead. Sorry, I think the first major takeaway, uh, and I honestly didn't expect this, is there's pretty much no weight limit. Um, depending on how aggressively you read the rules, it almost seems like you could bring in 3,000 pounds, eight different robots, and each time you inspect, you're running with a new robot. I, I have a feeling first is going to clarify that to where you're running, you know, what grandma would consider one robot per event. But you could still have a couple thousand pounds of parts, it sounds like. Um, Whereas in the past, you know, obviously what you could bag plus a withholding allowance uh, didn't easily accommodate that. I think you could technically bag whatever you wanted, but there were, uh, you know, reasonable limits based on the bag for that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think they're going to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'll stand. And, you know, I think it's going to be 100, 150 pounds. You bring it in, you know, you get inspected with that. Um, you know, they kind of talk about it a little bit in I i5 don't exploit i4 i think they'll keep the unlimited weight but they won't let you enter what are essentially multiple robots correct i, I agree yeah. that they'll let you with the limited weight it's 150 pounds of inspected stuff but you can have unlimited cots parts and identical replacement parts right so i mean i know like on our practice robot last year like our just our elevator is made out of 040 tube and we beat the crap out of it and bent it all to hell and so, like, we were on the practice robot just hammering, like, literally beating the elevator with a hammer, trying to get it back straight so the elevator could go up and down. But, like, I mean, but if I could just swap my elevator really quick and it's one-for-one one replacement and then I can fix it off, I mean, that's going to save, that would have saved us so much practice and everything. And if we could just do that at, at events, because, I mean, like, how we practice wasn't necessarily how we competed because, I mean, like, we drove into the rocket and into the human player station with our practice robot, but we knew we couldn't do that at the comp. So, like, our our ability to score quickly went down a few seconds just because we couldn't do that because we knew we couldn't quickly fix our elevator at comp. But now with the fact that I could just have an entire elevator assembly ready to go or whatever, you know, assuming, you know, like that, I could just throw a new one on because it was four bolts and and six rivets i mean that saved us so much time we could have been so much better than we were last year so the way i read it the 150 pounds is just per inspection you know you could come in with let's say 500 pounds of unique robot parts and another thousand pounds of spares um and kind of choose which top level configuration you're going to run per inspection and then once you're inspected swap a couple things in between there it sounds, I, I imagine if you exploit that to enter essentially two different robots, they would veto it, but it, it doesn't seem like there's any rule preventing you from inspecting with one 150 pounds with an elevator or something, and then pulling that elevator off, putting on something else, and re-inspecting, and then being limited to a new 150 pounds at that point, um, which does seem really generous and pretty wide open, but as written, I think that's legal. So in chat, um, Mark Kangila said, you can't actually run multiple robots at the same event. Rule I-5, I th or it says rule I-5, I think limits using reconfig to cheat by having a bunch of configs. And then a limb run said there was a response to a comment on the blog post essentially saying 2019 C5 is the same, i.e. compete with only one robot. So... Um, so as long as you bring, what, a full spare of the same robot? <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah it'll be interesting to see how the whole you know like what constitutes the robot pans out or you know where does all this like withholding or not withholding like all the the spare parts and stuff that you bring in does it all have to fit in your pit like they're saying bring it in at load in but i don't know i'm curious to see how teams kind of push the limits on that one i just keep thinking of like the the insanely high uh, camera polls in what 2016 or whatever, and finally they were like, okay, <laughs> no more. Like it can't be that high. So I do want to see 254 schlep 3,000 pounds of stuff on <laughs> at load in on their first event. I, I'm using ridiculous numbers on purpose. Going back and reading I5, uh, yeah, I was just obviously wrong on that one. So uh, you won't get away with multiple robots, but I am glad that you get essentially unlimited weight for spares. Mm -hmm. 3,000 pounds can get you many, many robots. Um, so Richard3620 says, this is for Eric. Um, he said, I predict a healthy queue line for early inspection. So that should be good. I don't. I think <laughs> just like Adam said at the beginning, there are going to be lots of teams uh, that, you know, expand their builds to uh, the Wednesday at 4 p.m. before their events because 4 p.m. is the deadline for when you can, uh, up until you can 
build your or work on your robot. Uh, so I think lots of teams are going to be doing that. And I think they're going to see more teams working on their robots practice day, trying to get ready for inspection than you ever did before. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.